Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Metro Theatre Company's virtual panel today. My name is Joe Thaller, and it is an honor and a privilege to serve as MTC's Managing Director and as today's moderator. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with Metro Theatre Company, we are St. Louis's third oldest professional theater and St. Louis's only professional theater devoted exclusively to programming work that is resonant for youth and families on stage, on tour, in the classroom, and now online. Being based in St. Louis, our offices and our performance venues sit on the traditional homelands of the Osage Nation, the Illinois Confederacy, and the Missouri. We pay respects to their elders, past and present, and we acknowledge the privilege that we hold by living and working on the land of their ancestors today. In all of our programs, MTC is deeply committed to ensuring that everything that we produce can create opportunities for meaningful dialogue within families and classrooms at one level and across our entire community and field at another level. When we began our 48th season, we had originally intended to produce Idris Goodwin's play, Jacked, as a play that would tour into schools. Instead, thanks to artistic director, Julia Flood, and the production's director, Jamie McKittrick, the play has now been produced entirely in a virtual environment using hand-drawn artwork by Nick Crea, animated by Michael Tran, with a score by Jackie Jackpot Sharp. The play is inspired by the Jack and the Beanstalk story, but one of the reasons MTC was drawn to it is because of the brilliant way that Idris uses that story as a launching pad to examine meaningful issues surrounding addiction and various kinds of substance use in a way that is age appropriate for young people from kindergarten through fourth grade. Addiction is an epidemic that impacts the lives of young people in our region disproportionately, not only as firsthand experiences with drugs and alcohol, but through the community impact as parents, families, and communities as a whole struggle with addiction, young people are very often caught in the middle. So today, we wanted to have a conversation to bring greater focus and understanding to those issues. We're joined by two leading experts in addiction in our region, Nicole Dawsey, the Executive Director at PreventEd, formerly the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, and Dr. Rachel Winograd, who serves as the Principal Investigator of the Missouri Opioid Heroin Overdose Prevention and Education Program at the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. In addition, we're joined by two experts on JACT, playwright Idris Goodwin, and Metro Theatre Company Artistic Director, Julia Flood. Before we dive deeply into how those issues play out in our community, let's get to know our panelists just a little bit more though. I'd like at this point to remind everyone watching at home that if you have any questions for our panelists, you can please feel free to post them below this video in the comments on YouTube or on Facebook, and we'll be sure to address them just a little bit later in the conversation. Now, first, Idris, could you talk a little bit about what inspired you to write this play? For sure, and uh, thanks so much for having me here, Joe, and I'm really excited to talk with everyone and, and to anyone viewing and listening right now out in the virtual landscape. Um, so yeah, my name is Idris Goodwin, he, him, his. Um, I am beaming in from Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, which is the unceded territory of the youth, the Cheyenne and Arapaho. Um, I am the director of the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College. Um, and I'm also a writer, first and foremost, primarily a writer and a dad and a concerned, uh, you know, adult. Uh, and uh, I used to be a resident of Louisville, Kentucky, and where I used to be the pro producing artistic director of Stage One Family Theater. And I was in my car one day listening to the national public radio, and there was a story about the impact of the opioid crisis um, on the foster care system. And that because of the rising number of adults uh, who were struggling with addiction to this um, powerful substance, that it was it was putting more kids into that system. So I reached out to shout out Lindsay Bale, who works uh, with the Jefferson County Public School Department, uh, specifically in the Office of Foster Care. And we had a lot of meetings and conversations about what she was seeing and what she had been observing in her work and what she was seeing in young people. I was mainly interested in, you know, as a dramatist, I'm interested in, you know, the psychological impact, right? And, and, and how this affects um, people, you know, you know, people in crisis and, and struggling with, 
you know, ex existential questions, ethical questions, you know, dealing with the impact of forces outside of their control. And so based on what she told me, I immediately thought, well, I should write a play about this and I should challenge myself as a writer to write a play for as young an audience as humanly possible. That was my challenge. And it was because she told me that, that what was happening a lot of times is the kids were, were thinking it was their fault. And that just really hit me hard. And so um, for some bizarre reason, Jack and the Beanstalk it was a framework for this. And here's why. It's because Jack and the Beanstalk is one of my least favorite fairy tales because it always felt unfinished to me. And so a lot of these old school stories are, are, are oral. They're told, they're passed down, they're remixed constantly. And I have this theory that somewhere along the way, the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, someone got lazy and just left out the ending because it's about this kid, him, him and his mom are poor. He gets some magic beans, he throws them in the ground, he goes up, he steals a bunch of stuff, a bunch of magical objects. And then he comes down and the giant comes after him and they chop the, the thing down. The giant dies and they just live happily ever after with these magical objects. Right. So um, but to me, it was something about a young person um, trying to elicit change because of their circumstance and grabbing things that they didn't necessarily understand. And and so I was convinced that I, it just to me, that just seemed like a good framework because I also wanted to extend the story of, of Jack and the Beanstalk and give it an actual, what I felt like was an actual proper ending. So somewhere in the crock pot of my brain, this story jacked happened. Um, and it was uh, commissioned by Cleveland Playhouse, shout out our friends at Cleveland Playhouse. Um, and their intent was to create a, 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 a live thing that would tour. At the time, I was also wanting stage one where I was working at the time to get into that uh, that work as well. And so we collaborated on the development of that. I brought in a great uh, music duo called Rhythm Science Sound and we cooked it up. And, and in 2019, it did tour. It did tour around uh, uh, Cleveland and, and that region. And then it came to Louisville and it toured around that area too. And then it was going to do uh, uh, something similar with you all in, in St. Louis. And then uh, uh, this other pandemic uh, this other epidemic called COVID said, oh, you think that's bad? Way to get a load of me. And, uh, and so here we are, here we are. And it's been um, an incredible, incredible experience, uh, mainly because um, when I was working on Jacked in the, its early forms, I brought my son, who was then seven, into the rehearsal room a lot, just because he's my quality control when I do anything for kids. I'm just like, are you feeling this? Like, you, you know what I mean? I lean over. I'm like, are you feeling this though? You know? And, uh, and so he felt good about it. So what was really great about this, but he, he never saw it when it was touring live, you know, in Cleveland and, and in Louisville. Uh, and so he was able to see this version, however, and it was very moving for me because he loved it. Like he really loved it. He was singing the songs and like, I've heard him say he loves the Mandalorian. I've heard him say he loves, you know, Harry Potter, but like, it was that same level of like, it wasn't like, I'm just being nice to you, dad. He was like, no, no, it's really good. <laughs> no, it's actually really good. You know? So anyway, I took the long ride on that one, but I feel like I'm the furthest one from where you all are. So that means I get the most time. <laughs> no worries. I, I'd love to talk to you next, Julie, and hear from you about sort of what drew you to this play. I know you worked with Eats yeah. before and a number of other projects, but but why Jacked? Well, to be honest, the very first thing that drew me to it is that Idris said, hey, I'm working on this new thing, you have to do it. And so I said, okay, if you're doing it, I'll do it. But um, yeah, I think exactly what Idris was saying about um, the child's eye view of addiction, that was very interesting to me. And that feeling that, um, that that it's your fault when something is going wrong with the adults. I think, and and it's interesting to me right now because I think there's so much stress in households that even households that aren't struggling with any kind of um, addiction or anything else are. I would imagine that kids would really relate to this. Uh, this feeling like I need to fix something that's wrong. And I, I never really thought about the, the bad ending of Jack and the Beanstalk until, 
until you said this, Idris. But yeah, it's like, wait, he stole this stuff. He killed that giant. He didn't even think about it. But um, yeah, some fairy tales are very scary in that way. Um, but yeah, and I think that the the nature of the way Idris uses language and merging with this, I mean, it was always intended, we had a different um, music producer on ours, but it was always intended to have this bed of sound underneath it. The storytelling is primarily the, the language and this music telling the story. So that was also very exciting to me. And I knew kids would really respond to that. Well, let's get to know you a second, Rachel, as well, before we get to see a little bit of the show and 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 meet everyone else on the panel. I, I, opioid, the opioid crisis has obviously brought a great deal of attention nationally to the challenges that communities all over the country are facing around addiction. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, your program at the Missouri Institute of uh, Mental Health and what it's doing to address this crisis in our state? What drew you to this work? Ah, oh, well, that's like five questions. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so yeah, I'm at UMSL, the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. Um, I'll start, I'll just go in order what you asked, that makes sense. Uh, where are we at now? Um, the I prefer to call it an overdose crisis or even a poisoning crisis, less so an opioid crisis. And I'll start there. I think um, we talk about this a lot. When we say the word opioid, people think of orange pill bottles. And that may be how a lot of this started, but it's not where we are now. It's moved way faster than what our policies can keep up with. So today, and in, in COVID, I think, really catalyzed and uh, escalated this. Uh, in most parts of the country that are seeing the highest rates of overdose death, we're seeing it because of fentanyl, which is you know an illicitly made substance that's extremely potent and can be, you know, absorbed and combined into all sorts of drugs. But uh, people might buy what they think is uh, heroin or even a certain type of pill on the street, and instead they get fentanyl, and it carries with it a much greater risk of death. So that's like you know the very straight forward brass tax answer. But of course, this is like incredibly nuanced and complicated and complex. And the crisis itself has unfolded in like really devastating and sad ways and is totally intertwined with a lot of the things that uh, we talk about when we talk about COVID, for example, you know, racism, class, uh, segregation, lack of access to health care, housing insecurity, poverty. I mean, this is these issues are all related um, and I, there are a lot of parallels to draw when we're talking about both epidemics. So um, to that extent, even though COVID has sort of lessened the coverage of the overdose crisis, my hope is that it's opening our eyes collectively a bit to all the inner relations of the maladies that blow through our country and hit people who are most vulnerable you know, the hardest, no matter what it may be. What got me into addiction, back to your, the question you ended on, um, I've always been fascinated by it. You know, yes, like drugs, what we think of as drugs, but I think it it's much bigger than that. Anything that alters our minds, I'm like, I'm, I'm pulled towards, honestly, myself. I feel the pull in me. I see it in my family. My family's been impacted, my friends. I, you know, I, it's, um, it's taken lives, it's disrupted families at the same time, like drugs are not all bad. You know, how many of us drank coffee this morning? How many of us have are on an antidepressant, you know, or, or we eat sugar, whatever, like we drink alcohol. Like it's, um, it's so nuanced and not only tied to pharmacology and what may specifically be in a substance, but the context in which we use drugs, the community that we exist in, uh, the laws that regulate these substances and police, people who use them. Uh, so to me, honestly, I feel like drug use and addiction are like so layered and complex that they're endlessly interesting. Um, and you could spend uh, 
you know, lifetimes and lifetimes of careers, understanding them better. And, um, and we need to do that. Uh, and, and I'm, I don't know why more people don't. Thank you. At I'm glad that for the hour we have together, we'll start to scratch the surface on some of this conversation, mm -hmm. but you've just brought so many of the layers that weave into this dialogue, I think powerfully forward, so thank you. I I'd love to take a second now and get to know Nicole just a little bit. N Nicole, PreventEd works extensively in schools to help prepare mm -hmm. young people to make responsible choices and to understand some of the decision-making that comes in around all the things Rachel was just addressing. Could, could you just tell us a little bit more about Prevent Ed's work and what drew you to that work there as well? Absolutely. So Prevent Ed, formerly NCADA, we've been around since 1965. We serve the seven county eastern region of Missouri. So that includes the city of St. Louis, St. Louis County, many of our outlying areas. But then we also do have a statewide presence. Um, you know, we, we work to reduce or prevent the harms of alcohol and other drug use. And we do that through three ways. Intervention, which speaks a lot to what um, Dr. Winograd was talking about. Um, so how can we get Narcan, um, which is a life-saving uh, substance in the hands of people who need it most and their families? Um, we work with um, advocacy and, and our legislators to try to think of some upstream public health common sense practices to really um, prevent some of these things from continuing to happen or to, to right some of the wrongs and some of the systemic um, issues that are have brought us to where we are today. Um, but then we also primarily do that through education. And in fact, 30 um, of our staff of 60, so half of our staff um, are in classrooms, either virtually or in person, each and every day delivering universal upstream prevention education to kids beginning in kindergarten. When I say universal, that means to all kids in all classrooms, whether somebody comes from a family that has been impacted by substance use disorders or not. And the reality is most families have been impacted. Many don't talk about it. So we begin in kindergarten, but in kindergarten, we are not talking about opioids. We are not talking about fentanyl. We are not talking about alcohol. We're talking about coping strategies, identifying grownups that you trust, um, some of those feelings, identifying those feelings, and then thinking about outlets to handle or manage those feelings. So for example, in, in the play, Jack, you know, he was dealing with lots of different feelings, longing, um, isolation, boredom, even hopelessness. Like, how am I going to help my mom, you know, figure this out? Desperation. Um, kids, even as young as kindergarten, feel those things. They don't always have the words to put to those feelings, but they feel them. As the the kids get older, we'll start introducing more drug specific topics at really age appropriate ways. So fifth grade, for example, is the first time we start talking about cannabis or we start talking about vaping, although most kids already know about it well before we start talking about it. Um, once the, the students move into high school, we're going into their health classrooms and we're supplementing curricula that health teachers need assistance with. I mean, they went to school um, a long time ago and they cannot be experts on everything. This is changing very rapidly and they rely on us to come in and deliver fact, scientific information, not exaggeration, not scare tactics. This is not just say no. Um, and then we're really working to empower teens realizing how much how much power they really have and thinking about how to use their voices to be messengers. So we do a lot of peer teaching programs because I'm really cool, not, but I, teenagers are a lot cooler than me. And so they're much better on delivering the message. Um, what got me into this? I'm a teacher by trade and I taught middle school and I realized that my kids were facing uphill battles before they even walked into the classroom. And so for me to expect that they were going to care about division or the Roman empire, when they're just trying to figure out how they're gonna help their mom put food on the table, or maybe they were up all night because they had to watch their siblings while their caregivers were working or in the casino gambling, 
or whatever. They they needed life skills and they needed coping strategies so that they could cope in healthy ways, not right or wrong ways, not bad or good, but healthy ways. So um, I, I'm a teacher by trade. I really value Metro Theater and, and all that they do to kind of merge this the arts with all of these other topics that are so necessary for kids because um, they're, they're listening and they're watching. So they, they see what's going on and, and they know when their parents or their caregivers are struggling. They, they feel it. We are very lucky in St. Louis to have prevented here um, and, and all the work that Prevent Ed does in this region, I think, um, makes the young people in our region that much more prepared to be able to face all of the unknowns that I think are, are, are coming before them every day and in, in ways that evolve dramatically uh, from, I'm sure, when you were in middle school teaching to where you are right now, just like from when that health teacher first was prepared to walk into the classroom to to now that health teacher some years later. So I and we hope at Metro that Chact is playing some role, at least in being able to start those conversations. Um, it's a play that's now been playing to audiences across the country um, and to schools across our region since uh, late January. But at this point in the discussion, we thought it might make sense to share a clip to provide a little bit more context for those who haven't seen it yet. So Julia, can I pass things over to you to help people uh, know a little bit more about what this first moment in the show is that we're about to see? Sure. Uh, this one, I think, is pretty self-explanatory because it is from a, the part of the play that is uh, still within the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. So this is the moment where Jack um, is offered the beans in exchange for his cow. So if we could see these three seeds are going to blow your mind. Just put them in the dirt. That's how they work. These three seeds are gonna blow your mind. Just put them in the dirt? That's how they work. These three seeds are gonna blow your mind. Just put them in the dirt, watch how they work. These three seeds gonna blow my mind. Those three seeds are gonna blow your mind. So, we have a deal? These three seeds gonna blow your mind. I did it. I saved Daisy. And I rushed home excited, bust in the house to tell mama. Awesome. Sorry, I was on mute there for a second. <laughs> um, that's that's a great like little tiny taste of this really amazing piece. Um, let's talk about just that that clip for a second and what that kind of brings forward. Um, obviously, you know, just the way the magic beans are framed uh, alludes right to that moment that like we might imagine when a kid might be first approached and might first you know have the potential to get hooked on something. Um, how does this compare, Nicole, to the kind of experiences that you, you see young people facing in St. Louis right now? It's, it's very similar. Um, back when I was growing up, we, we talked a lot about this idea of peer pressure, and that doesn't really exist. We, we've changed it now, um, and, and kids recognize it as peer influence, because really nobody is at a party or on a Zoom saying, here, try this, try this but it's the idea of being left out. It's FOMO. Nobody wants to be left out, right? And especially if you are looking around and the norms of the community, however you define it, are that, you know, this, this is okay, or this is acceptable, or this is fun. Um, ab you know, absolutely that, that rings true. Um, I will say that, you know, I mentioned what we did in schools, in classrooms, and, and that's for all kids. We also know that some teenagers will start to experiment and will start to experience some difficulty. They might get in trouble from their school counselor because they're caught vaping in a school bathroom or their adult finds a joint in their room. Um, dollars to donuts, that kid just probably does not need treatment. Um, in fact, that could actually do more harm than good. And that student dollars to donuts should not be exposed to the criminal justice system. And we know that many districts, because 
they didn't go to school for that. That's not what they're equipped to do. They many times would kind of feel like in order to address it, they would either have to make a referral or get a juvenile officer involved or turn a blind eye and ignore it. And that's no good either, because while they probably don't have a substance use disorder, there's probably something else going on. And so we have a program that is free to anyone from 13 to 19 where they can come. It can be a self-referral. So a parent or guardian or a school district or a guidance counselor or a pastor could refer a teen to us, say, hey, something's going on here. I don't know what it is. We can do a little digging. It's not just one hour because nobody's cracking a teenage nut in an hour. You need a little bit more time to figure out what's going on. Maybe they need a positive outlet. Maybe their parents are going through a divorce. Maybe literally all of their friends smoke weed. Maybe that's what their friends do for fun. Um, And maybe, you know what? They don't really know why they did it. They just did it. So um, there's a lot of non-punitive approaches to help teenagers deal with some of these feelings, they're they're in the feelings, um, to deal with some of these feelings that the clip just kind of showed. And so this idea of peer influence is certainly difficult to navigate. um, And I'm so happy that I'm not a teenager. (laughs) I'm so happy, I'm so thankful every day I'm not a teenager. Idris, I'd love to hear your perspective on that scene as well. what do you think a kid makes of a moment like that when when a moment like that comes co- a, appears in their life? Yeah, I mean, I also want to just second that I'm also glad I'm not a teenager. Um, I don't know if you guys saw it in the New York Times. There was an article. Uh, it was really powerful, and I haven't stopped thinking about it. It was all these teenagers creating art reflecting on this this last year and COVID and missing out and all. It just breaks. It tears my heart up. Like. I, I I'm so all I think about is how much just as an adult, I feel like we failed them. You know, I just I just can't stop thinking about it. And so like anyway, um, uh, that moment. So that moment is just it's actually kind of a fake out moment um, because it's it's really the transfer. It's getting the beans, you know, to go up the stock and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, leads to the leads to the leads. It's like kind of a little bit of my own like nerdy play on the idea of the gateway. Um, uh, but really, to me, drama is all about choices, right? And choices are motivated by this word Nicole just used, which is feelings. And for me, I wrote this play because, you know, you know, part of part of our, you know, American ethos and our and our sort of very bizarre ways is we have a very hard time engaging in and taking seriously feelings and emotions. And that's what this is really for me about. It's that it started from, okay, all these kids are getting put in the foster care system because of opioid use or what we're learning is, is, is um, uh, fentanyl uh, really in a, a, an overdose problem. Um, uh what did that what does that do to them psychologically and some of the research i did i mean it's it's some of it's irreparable i mean there's there it's it's ptsd for life you know what i mean and um and for me that's what drama is about it's about empathy it's about feelings it's about emotions it's about the psychological impact of of all of these things and so for me nicole pointed it out perfectly which is like it's about the road that led, like, hopefully if I'm doing my job and, and the animators and the director are doing their job, we understand why Jack wants those beans in that moment. We understand why he makes that choice. So, yes, the bad commercials that as a Reagan baby I grew up with, this is your brain on drugs, all that crap, you know, the Nancy Reagan, all that crap, right? Like, what we weren't talking about is why, like, what are the conditions? Why does a person do this? I mean, as we're starting to peel back the layers of the war on drugs and what that did to black communities, I mean, we see is deeper than that. And, and we got to start talking about the feelings. Why do people abuse these things? Now we know some of it has to do, you know, it's a real illness. It's some people have a proclivity to get to, to they can't just drink casually, you know, they got to drink till they fall down blackout wasted, right? So some people have that condition. 
but some people it's it's just purely to mask it's, it's to hide it's it's to not feel left out you know that's the stuff we got to talk about a substance is just a substance it's literally called a substance right it could be anything and so you know for me I'm interested in us talking about feelings and motivation and like why we do the things we do and and, and all that more messy stuff. The answers will get shorter, I promise you. <laughs> well, I think that we've just been spending a lot of time in thinking about some of the why or some of the headspace that, that people are in during, during moments like this um, in their lives. But Rachel, I'd love to take this over to you for a little bit more context uh, about sort of the the broader circumstances uh, that we're seeing in 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 our state right now around addiction, you you live with these numbers every day, um, and opioid addiction isn't the only form of um, uh, of a substance um, a, a substance use disorders. I'm trying to get that right, Nicole. Uh, I'd say it it will roll off my tongue the way it rolls off of yours, um, but it, it does feel like what's happening in that space, the that overdose space you're talking about has a great deal of weight right now. Where, where are you seeing the greatest spikes in, in those disorders in Missouri now? Do you have a sense of how it's evolving, rural, suburban, urban? Who's being impacted um, most? Yeah, thanks, Joe. I'll touch on that in a second. But if I may, can I just extend what y'all were just talking about? Um, this is where it gets like really, really nitty gritty interesting for me because in addition to us acknowledging, you know, the the background, maybe negative factors that drive people to substance use and what they do to mask it, you know, and to, to cope, uh, which we absolutely have to talk about and acknowledge, we also need to collectively acknowledge the reality that drugs also make people feel good and people use them when nothing is wrong. And most people who use drugs don't have an addiction. Nicole, you alluded to this. And like, even as a teenager, and that extends into adulthood, and it's all about context and consequences. And then like, if the substance use isn't interfering with your life, then it's not a substance use disorder. And how do you define interfering? And is that so subjective? And how much is too much? You know, there's this uh, professor who's recently gotten a, a come online a bunch, everyone should look him up, Dr. Carl Hart, who wrote a book called Drug Use for Grownups. He's the chair of the psychology department at Columbia University, and he essentially came out as a recreational drug user, including heroin, methamphetamine, LSD. He is a black man uh, who's a neuroscientist, who's a recreational drug user, you know, he like embodies all of these identities and uh, has been incredibly courageous in coming out to say, hey, we need to talk about people like me who don't fit our definition of, you know, someone who quote unquote abuses drugs or who is a quote unquote addict. These are words like we try not to use, you know. Um, anyway, so in addition to talking about like healthy coping skills, I'm excited to look at like the next generation of prevention initiatives which are about safe drug use education, acknowledging that people are gonna use. So if you do use, here's how to do so safely. You know, because we gotta be honest, that's what a lot of teenagers are gonna do. And so um, I think that's still pretty niche. And, you know, um, we see it in the coastal cities, shall we say, San Francisco and New York. Um, but I, I think those are conversations we need to have. So, um, you know, if and when somebody passes you a joint at a party and you know you're gonna hit it, what should you do? What should you look out for? Should you be the first one? Should you wait for someone else to go? You know, don't drink alcohol first, you know, things like that that are just more um, you know, strategies. Yeah, that's and that's that's the harder that's the, the harder conversation, but it's in a way it's the easier conversation. And I think it really speaks to um just a, a sort of repressive culture that 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 is at the heart of America. I mean, mm -hmm. when it comes to sex and when it comes to drug abuse, vice, right? Yeah. Th there's all these connotations. And listen, if we want to go back to, there's a, a certainly an intersection of race in there and patriarchy yeah. in there as well, right? And so, you know, when we're ready to like have these these adult conversations for real, um, especially because you know there's a hypocrisy as well that like 
you know, everyone also had their turn at the spout, so to speak. So, um, yeah, so it, it is it is a seemingly radical or revolutionary thing. Um, but it is it is I, I consider it to be actually a smarter and more responsible, uh, you know, path path to take, because I think the fear is just like, are you saying it's OK? And it's like, aren't we past? Aren't we past that? Aren't we past like good and bad and OK and not OK, you know? Um, anyway, sorry to cut you off, Rachel. But no, I, just, I mean, you're totally right. Point. Well, Joe, I've totally ignored your main question, but, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah, that's the the gist is it's when we talk about like drug use and sex, it's always about are we condoning? Are we enabling? Are we giving people permission to do something that could result in harm? And the fact of the matter is people are going to do it whether they have permission or not. And just like we had the you know, revolution in sex education to talk about safe sex and condoms, it's about time that we, we do that with drugs. Um, but to your question, Joe, uh, what are we seeing here in Missouri? Um, you know, Briefly, I'll say we tend to rank about 17th or 18th in terms of overdose rates nationally overall. Um, I will say uh, regarding your comment, Idris, about race and racism, we rank third for black overdose death rates. This is something that has been um, growing in recent years. Uh, it's driven by the St. Louis region uh, where we have, uh, shall we say, a densely populated area on a drug trafficking route and a lot of reasons to use drugs. So uh, taken together, there's a lot of vulnerability and risk here. Opioids are still involved in about 75% of deaths. And of course, when I say opioids, I'm not talking about pills. I'm talking about mostly fentanyl and then maybe heroin and then pills. We're seeing more and more um, deaths involving methamphetamine, not so much meth by itself, but meth in combination with fentanyl. Um, and then after that, you know, you see other, other substances here and there, but those are the big ones. Um, in Missouri, it, it's still driven by urban centers, really the St. Louis area. You see pockets of really high rates in some rural counties. Um, and it's tricky there too, because then you're dealing with, you know, rates that are very high, but actual counts of humans that are not that high. So this gets into like some tricky discourse and politics about who deserves the resources, you know. Um, and so that's, of course, underlying a lot of the discussions about funding and grants and where we go next. Um, but I will say, just to put a pin in this, I think that the biggest things that we're dealing with in Missouri are um, the increase in deaths since COVID started, which has been seen nationally, and the growing racial disparities, such that Black men specifically in Missouri are more than four times as likely to die of a drug overdose than the general population. So a lot of our interventions that we've been working on developing and deploying in the last few years are working for some people, they're reaching some people, but not everybody. And that's a problem. That actually is a great segue maybe into a broader group conversation we can have for a little bit um, before we see one more clip from the show. It, we've talked about harm, we've talked about harm reduction, we've talked about all manner of um, risk that, um, might create circumstances that make certain choices more desirable at certain points in time. Um, I, I feel as if the subtext of so much of this, particularly in our region, and no longer subtext, because you called it right out, Rachel, I'm grateful to you for that, is the deep challenges that we face in our region, we face across our country when it comes to questions of racial justice. And obviously the police involved deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others this past summer, I think raised a collective consciousness around those questions. I'd, I'd love to get the sense from everyone who's sort of in this space as to how the collective movement around racial justice that seems to now be growing uh, traction, traction that it should have had grown for many years prior to these terrible, terrible events of this past summer. How are you seeing that collective movement really impact the work around uh, substance use disorders in our community? Um, so I can go first on that one if you don't Please. mind. And, and first I'd like to just kind of piggyback onto the, the last part of the conversation. I would, I would push back just a little bit to suggest that 
you're going to do it anyway, because for some people for, with their religion or their culture or their family history, it's just not an option. Um, and, and this idea of wellness has certainly been whitewashed, um, but it's increasingly being embraced and elevated by um, people of color and, and actually like, hey, we've been doing that long before y'all have been talking about it. Um, so sorry. And so that's, I think, one way that what's going on racially in this country, the, the reckoning that is really happening is encouraging us to think about different ideas of wellness and to think about our messaging. Because for some cultures, for example, it drinking is, is not even an option. Um, for other cultures, um, it is a rite of passage um, it, and is closely tied with religious institutions. So again, this idea of right and wrong, good or bad, um, really needs to go out the door. Um, Joe, you mentioned risk, and that is something that we start talking with fifth graders about because life is all about risk, right? If, if you are sitting here right now having this conversation, you're full of risks. A dog could start barking. You might have something in your teeth, right? You might mess up and say the wrong thing. That's a risk. But you've also calculated that it's a risk worth engaging in. Teens brains are hardwired to take risks. It's why they ask out their crush. It's why they try out for a play or, you know, um, try to do something that they've never done before. And it's also also why sometimes they get themselves into a little bit of trouble. Um, if we can kind of help them rethink this idea of risk and healthy risk, and that has no um, color implications, but it's how do we as a staff really kind of step out of our own way and help each individual student that we're serving understand how this cause impacts them personally. One thing that we've been doing, and, and then I'll be quiet, is um, we've really taken a step back. For a long time, we felt like we had to kind of be the expert on everything. And I'm not a black woman. I'm not even a person in recovery. So how can I step back to elevate lived experience and community voice and use the power and privilege that I do have at the organization that I do have, how can we create a megaphone for those individuals who are who are doing the work, who've been doing the work for a long time or who have some lived experience? So it's really sort of turned a lot of what we do and how we do it on its head. But this idea of risk um, is something that I think we've really become centered around um, because that unites us all. We, we all like to take risks and some of us are risk averse like myself and some of us are diving in. My five-year-old was watching this show. Yeah, my five-year-old was watching this show and I said, would you climb the beanstalk or would you stay on the ground? And she's like, climb it, climb it. Now I'm freaking out because I'm like, stay on the ground, stay on the ground. But I know what I'm in for in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Nicole. I, I, I'd love to expand this. No, I won't say anything. Just jump off of what Nicole said, if you'd like. Rachel, Idris, Julia. I mean, I'll, I'll say very briefly, um, a lot of the work on our team, we've started to be maybe even a little bit bolder about pushing some ideas or agendas that we danced around the edges of previously. I mean, most tangibly, look at St. Louis, you look at the segregation above and below the Del Mar Divide. When it comes to addiction treatment and recovery resources, it's nada, basically, in the predominantly Black neighborhoods in St. North St. Louis City and North St. Louis County. Um, so we've put a little, you know, or a lot more muscle behind advocacy work um, to get more resources there. And obviously that's not going to happen on a dime. So it's a long, lengthy, clumsy, messy process. Um, who's, who's at the table? What has to happen? What emails have to be sent? What boring grants have to be written? Budgets have to be analyzed. It's not always like glamorous and sexy on the front lines, but it's like who's crunching the numbers to invest in areas that um, have been systematically disinvested in for decades and decades. And, and again, it comes back to this piece of everything's all related. 
you know, you're not going to have a beautiful, comprehensive, full spectrum addiction treatment and recovery program in the middle of an area where their, you know, home values have plummeted and there's, you know, over policing and violence and poverty and um, people who are super desperate because, you know, they're poor and they're black and they've had very few opportunities um, to to thrive and in St. Louis, very different opportunities than people three miles away. So, I mean, that's something like specific, but, but tangible that um, I think we need to keep our eye on uh, those who are working in this field, in this region. And we work closely with, with Nicole and prevent ed um, to do a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here. Is, is there a sense that you're getting that people are people who have access to power are changing the degree to which they are receptive yes. to understanding how these racial disparities, the circumstances that have created these racial disparities, right? Are you seeing that change in St. Louis? Even by degree, are you seeing that change? I, yeah. I would just say, and then Rachel, you have more experience in this. I will say we are seeing progress. Determinants of the, oof. Everything I think froze. there's we're back. <laughs> I think there's we're seeing progress. There is more attention being paid to social determinants of health than ever before. I think that's because of COVID, though. And so we're being reactive instead of proactive. We're trying to now do this debrief, like what sh what lessons can we learn from COVID to apply to all of these other things? And it's like, well, why don't we actually look at some of the root causes? Let, let's do that. And then let's think about where we can plug in resources. So I do think there is movement there. Um, Rachel, you, you, I'm sure have other or additional thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the day. Um, I, I, Slowly but surely, yes. I think it's it's way too slow for a lot of people, uh, understandably. And for some people, it feels like slow down. Like we, we're, um, it, it's a ship. What's that metaphor? It's a, it takes a long time to move a ship in the ocean, turn a tide. You know, something about a battleship. Something a Yes. Anyway, so uh, yeah, you know, I'll I'll hear things that come back to me in in meetings of people, you know, with way more more power than I do, saying like, oh, they brought up the North County treatment desert in that meeting when talking about how to allocate these upcoming funds, and it's like, okay, you know, that that wouldn't have happened if we didn't collectively all bring this to people's attention and make maps and highlight important points and that, but is it gonna happen this year? No, is it gonna take a lot more like pressing and prodding? Yeah, and also I think the thing that's really discouraging maybe is the word for a lot of us, you know, in the wake of George Floyd's killing and this movement, it, there was a lot of like urgency and then it's like, okay, what do we do with this urgency so we're not hasty? And then what do we do when we realize, oh, it's actually, not about maybe necessarily an individual's racism. It's about the systemic and structural racism. Okay, well, what does that mean? Because our systems are made up of individual human beings. So what human being do I have to talk to? Who's gonna make this decision? And it's like, the, the person doesn't exist. You know, so it's very um, tricky to like pinpoint who you have to go to, what change you have to make to see an appreciable difference in these long-term health outcomes that we all wanted to see changes in 10 years ago. It sounds like what I'm hearing is that there is, we're in a moment where people's ears are more open. Maybe their hearts are more open. Maybe they've, they have educated themselves better than they were educated before, but that doesn't take the onus on those of us who are trying to do the work to push that message that much harder to help us see a more equitable, better backyard for everyone in St. Louis, because that will lead to uh, equitable health, health outcomes, or at least proportionately consistent health outcomes, regardless of where you grew up, what that zip code is, what your census track is, what the color of your skin is, what the color of your grandparents' skin was, that there's 
that there may be some hope. I, I'm a hopeful person, so I lean into hope at times. Um, but I, 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 I think that, that this group together and so many people who are doing this work in so many ways are at least trying to incrementally move that needle. And if we do move that needle a little, it makes it easier maybe to move that needle a little, a little further. Um, I would love to um, let us see one more clip and then we have a few more things we can talk about. Um, and uh, what I would love to also remind anyone who's watching at home right now, if you have a question, please feel free to share your questions in the chat, um, in YouTube or in Facebook. You can just look directly below us and type in if you'd like to type in. But there's an amazing conversation happening here. So just enjoy it if you'd rather enjoy it and not uh, throw in more questions. But um, perhaps looking at this next clip, um, I could have either Julia or, or Idris uh, kind of give us the setup for what we're about to see. I can, yeah, this is a little later in the play when um, the, the adults have started swallowing the golden eggs and then when the golden eggs are gone, they start swallowing other things and uh, it's very confusing for Jack. So this is, uh, this is that clip. I think that's all you need to know. Bronze eggs made people move slow. Quartz eggs made them rock to and fro. Glitter eggs made them spin and start to dance. Polka dot eggs move less and wave hands. Bronze, quartz, glitter, polka dot eggs. Borrow, steal, please, beg. The ones with stripes made them see light. The plasma smell bad made them stay up nice. Bronze, quartz, glitter, polka dot eggs. Borrow a seal, a plead, a bed. I didn't understand. How could it go from a powerful feeling to eating something that you know will just make you mean? It was getting scary out here. People were acting bizarre, out of control, lying, stealing. <laughs> So we just gave away a little bit of um, where the play goes after the, uh, the 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 bad ending of the original fairy tale that didn't exist. We've we've got a little more of what happens next as a result of these magical objects being part of uh, Jack's world. Um, uh, I uh, would love from there to actually kind of raise a question um, that's come in from one of our uh, folks watching online. This is from Liz. Uh, she had a question on Facebook, and I'm going to ask the question. Um, but I think the question expands really beautifully for everybody. The initial question was mainly for Julia, which was to get a sense of what were choices that you and the rest of the artistic team made to represent mm -hmm. the complex issues that are being discussed today, especially from a child's perspective. But I'd love to hear from you, but then kind of expand that out into all the programs that we've been talking about um, and, and really think about that question of, you know, whether it is through this piece or whether it's through what Prevent Ed does, um, how do we know what issues kids are prepared to talk about and address at an early age? And mm. how do we frame the, those conversations to, 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 to serve young people at the stage and development they are? So let me take the first question to you, Julia, and Nicole, give you a second to think about that while Julia answers. Sure, well, um, the team really was working to uh, create a piece that gave a lot of space for kids to use their imaginations to fill the story out. Um, and that is sort of along the lines of what we were talking about earlier about the feelings and the various um, questions that we had of putting themselves in this moment to see their own point of view on the story. And that uh, I, I think, what I love that Idris did beautifully and then Jamie, our director and the team, uh, is to create something that is both entertaining, but also can raise questions so that a parent or a teacher can respond directly to what a child is wondering in that moment. So when they are interpreting what they're seeing, it, it's a, a gentle pathway into the conversation. So that we're not pounding things, you know, don't do drugs, just say no. We're not pounding on an issue. We are presenting a story that allows uh, a child's imagination to 
um, to form questions naturally that then can be discussed. It's, I, I was thinking when Rachel and Nicole were talking about the policy level of approaching this issue. And we are really at Metro Theater Company coming from exactly the opposite. We're coming from the ground up because we are seeing young people who are still forming who they are and where they're going to go, right? So, and we're seeing the full breadth of the community because we serve schools and parents. So we're seeing the broad spectrum of the young people who will be the future of our city. And um, so we are opening those pathways to conversation to help them to make choices when the choices come. And it is all about conversation, right? It, that's what it's about. And so that's where it starts. Um, and so some people might be watching this or, uh, and, and thinking, well, what can I do? You know, how can I, how can I impact the system? Well, part of it is just having a conversation in your own living room or in the car or at the dinner table. If people even eat dinner together anymore, I'm not sure, but having those conversations. And so, um, we have, um, and, and I think a visual is going to pull this up, but we have at our organization on our website, we have five free age specific talking kits that caregivers or adults can use when they're trying to broach those conversations. Um, the youngest one is actually pre K to second grade. And you're asking just, just open-ended floating questions like what, what is medicine? Who, who can give you medicine? You know, gummy vitamins are, can you take those by yourself? Why? Why not? You're not talking about drugs. They're just very like gentle conversations. As the kids get older, you really can, can turn up the dial. So middle school, for example, like, what do you think an appropriate consequence would be if I found out that you were using drugs? Or what questions should I be asking when you go out with your friends? Like kids want to talk even when they pretend like they don't. Um, but this idea of having like one drug talk where we sit down and we, you know, just spew facts, like we got to throw that notion out the door. Um, we even have one age specific talk. Well, it's not even age specific one specific talking kit where if you're concerned about somebody so teens can talk to their their teens their their friends if they're concerned about a, a pattern of behavior caregivers can talk to their the kids um, in their lives um, we've even had teenagers using this on their adults because we know again that they're seeing and so it's things like i care about you i'm noticing what's happening this is how it's making me feel and how can I support you to get some some help? Um, but again, those are free. They're accessible even on your cell phone. Um, and they're available at talkaboutitmo.com. Talkaboutitmo.com. That's great. And I feel like as we're wrapping up, the idea of being able to point to what we can do to, to make the environment we all sort of inhabit together with our children, with our families, with our broader communities, better, stronger, more thoughtful, um, is the, sort of the best place to potentially sort of leave our conversation today. I, I have a few closing remarks but before I go into those. Would anyone else like to share thoughts on what those wonderful people watching at home could, could do um, if they're interested in, in this work and improving the quality of life for young people around these questions of substances and substance use? Rachel, I see you leaning forward like you might want to say something. With my unmute button. <laughs> um, yeah, oof. I mean, <clears throat> I think the, the easiest thing to do is to promote these conversations within your home and with friends about humanizing people who use drugs, talking about people's inherent worth and for you know, dignity, autonomy, uh, freedom, and personal choice. Uh, to sort of get away, as Nicole said earlier, from good, bad, right, wrong, like appreciate the nuance and complexity of all of this, 
um, and just not to disbelieve everything you hear about people who use drugs or what works for addiction because there are a lot of really good opinions out there that are worth reading up on. Julia Idris, any thoughts? Uh, that's all right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, it's really been such a pleasure uh, getting to spend this last hour with, with all of you on this panel um, and everyone who's watching at home as well. Um, I, I do want to take a moment to thank our presenting sponsor for Jacked, the Whitaker Foundation, for their very generous underwriting. Lots, lots of applause and snaps. Um, as well as the Children's Theatre Foundation of America for their support of this project. More, more applause, snaps. Uh, you can clap at home if you like. Um, I also want to encourage everyone who's watching right now to learn more both about PreventEd and the Missouri Institute for Mental Health. The websites for those organizations will be appearing on your screen now. Um, Thank you, Idris. If you don't already, consider following both of these wonderful organizations on social media and consider finding ways to support the good work that they are doing to keep our region safer, healthier, and reduce harm um, as much as possible in the lives of the young people um, that, that will be our future. If you haven't seen Jack yet, but would like to, there is still time. The virtual stream is running on the Metro Theater Company website through March the 31st and the virtual school field trips that we are offering are going to be available through the end of the school year. Um, you can watch the production at metroplays.org backslash jacked. And when the production opened, we did offer a pay what you can period to eliminate any um, economic accessibility barrier to seeing the show. It's actually something that we have committed to at Metro Theater throughout the pandemic and that we plan to commit to the community as we move to the other side of this pandemic, always making sure that performances are available at a pay what you can basis for at least a portion of every show's run to make sure that we are as inclusive as possible to everyone here in St. Louis. I'm very pleased to share that we are adding another five day pay what you can window just for Jacked next week, starting on March the 15th. You can, I, Rachel looks excited, I know. <laughs> It's, uh, it's great news world. So um, you can reserve your tickets now um, at the pay what you can pricing, and then you can start to watch the broadcast next week with that opportunity. Otherwise, tickets only start, uh, start at only $16. So um, if you can view Jack for $16, we're grateful too. Um, I'm also pleased to share, um, as you've been listening to those clips, you've heard some of that really awesome uh, soundtrack to this show. Um, the soundtrack, the original cast recording of Jacked is now available on iTunes, Google Music, Spotify, Pandora, and wherever you get your streaming music. Oh, that's uh, everywhere. That's, that's everywhere. The, that is everywhere. When we, when we posted it, I think there are like 17 places you can get streaming music now, and I'd only heard of half of them because I'm not one of the cool kids at the moment. But one day, I will figure out how to stream from TikTok, and that will be it's great. promo, Joe. Even adults have it. Even I adults know. have it. <laughs> <laughs> One day, look look for me this time next year on TikTok, and we'll see how how things are going. <laughs> um, I also want to share really great news. Had another one of Idris's plays, which Metro Theater Company originally produced in 2016, is going to return for pay per view streaming later this month. We are joined by Rachel's beautiful children. That is awesome. Hello, Rachel's beautiful children. There are more where this came from, but don't worry. <laughs> um, the play of Idris is that's uh, going to start streaming um, uh, later in March is And In This Corner, Cassius Clay. It's something of an origin story of the life of the young Muhammad Ali. It's going to be available March 22nd through the 26th. Pay what you can, and then it will continue on for another month. Um, Idris, do you want to say anything about that that production before we, we, uh, we come to a close, other than it's awesome and people should see it? It's awesome and people should see it. Excellent. <laughs> Um, I would re be remiss if I didn't invite everyone watching and everyone on this panel to join us when we resume live performances in an outdoor, socially distant, and safe manner with a bilingual 75 puppet production of The Very Hungry Caterpillar Show um, based on four of Eric Carle's delightful children's books. Um, it begins April the 25th. Um, at the uh, the lawn at the Kirkwood Performing Arts Center. You can learn more about that on our website and you can even sign up 
for our pre-sale ticket list. Tickets will be going on sale uh, later this month. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Does anyone have any last words they would like to share? The answer can be no. Waving at the camera with joy Just and thank love. You. Is Just one. thank you. Just thank you, Nicole and Rachel. Um, and thank you, Metro Theater, for hooking this up. This was uh, really wonderful. Yeah, it was great. Thank you all. Oh, and here's another one. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, okay. Idris, Julia, Thank you all so the much. artists that brought this play to life. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Nicole. We are so grateful for the work you do in our community. We hope everyone has a wonderful evening with their families. Um, that looks like an amazing spoon. I'm not sure. Maybe it's not a spoon. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go on. okay. Good night, everybody. Thank Good you night. for joining us. Good night. Okay. How do I exit?